program today. I'll be happy to get you a ticket, but I would guess that probably after this, if no one gets them today, I would guess that within the next week, we are going to be sold out. Today's speaker is Kelly B. Missouri. Kelly is a historian whose work focuses on the Black men who served in the United States Colored Troops and the Union Navy, both during the American Civil War and in their lives as veterans in the late 19th century. Her, her book, For Their Own Cause, the 27th United States Colored Troops, published by Kent State University Press in 2016, was a 2017 Ohio Book Award nonfiction finalist. She's also published essays uh, on USCT soldiers who served as prison guards and Black veterans who resided in Midwestern soldiers' homes. Kelly has served as a professor of history at Northeastern Ohio Universities for over 20 years. She's a member of the Ohio Humanities Speakers Bureau and served on the Ohio Civil War 150 Advisory Committee. She's currently working on an edited volume of private letters sent to and from Black soldiers and sailors during the Civil War. I know Kelly brought a few copies of her book here, and I brought my own copy uh, for her to sign. I can't begin to tell you how good it is. Uh, I'm a fan of modern regimental histories uh, that take you know a more holistic approach. You know, the, the, the older ones they may talk more about the officers, about the battles, about the, the movements, and things like that. Um, that's what we're used to hearing about in these regimental histories that were published by the veterans. Um, but you know. Kelly's book looks at the common soldiers, uh, the men who did the fighting, you, and you still get the battles, you get the movements, you get the officers, um, but she also looks more at men who suffered uh, from disease and camp or as prisoners of war, uh, these men who bore the, the physical and mental and emotional scars of war for the rest of their lives. Her book does a wonderful job at that, um, bringing these USCT soldiers, these guys who are far too often nameless and faceless in our history. She does a great job of bringing them to life. So as far as modern regimental history goes, this one is at the top of my list. So I highly encourage you to grab a copy today. Uh, she is here today to speak about Frederick Douglass and his efforts at USCT recruiting during the Civil War. Ladies and gentlemen, Kelly Missouri. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this unseasonably warm February Saturday. And we don't get that often, and so I could see you wanting to do something else this afternoon. So I, I really appreciate you being here so very much. And uh, John Eric, I'll take you and you can introduce me to the online talks in the future. Thank you. It's very kind of you. All right. Always have to give you the uh, warning or ask for your grace via technology. All right. There we go, it worked. So thank you to all the different sponsors of this program, and including the library, the opportunity to view this incredible treasure you have, the GAR room. I'm sure I'm talking you know, to people that have all been in it, but if you haven't, get in there. That's absolutely wonderful. So today I wanna to talk to you um, about a very specific way um, at looking at Frederick Douglass. We're, we're not gonna be talking about his life, his, his multiple um, remaking of, it, of himself through his three autobiographies, the way he remade himself through his photographs. He is the most photographed 19th century American. And he made sure every time he was photographed, have a, right, you know, he wanted people to get his, uh, his attitude in, in his photographs. There are several excellent books written, and these are just two. Um, I like the McFeely book because I read it in graduate school. He is a little older now. And then there's Frederick Douglass' um, book. Actually, David Blight is, is the person you want to read when it comes to Frederick Douglass. But this is the one that really looks at you know, his life during the Civil War. We're not going to be talking about you know, that larger life of Frederick Douglass. Um, I, I really just want to look at one thing, and that question is, how did readers of the Anglo-African learn about Frederick Douglass? What did they learn about him during the Civil War? Right? I, I just want to look at his recruiting and how it was recorded. And hopefully then that can add to what you learn from reading these you know, larger biographies or pieces on him. 
So before we get started, though, I do want to do just a little background on the United States Colored Troops in case it's a topic that is new to some of you. Again, I know I'm speaking to Civil War uh, enthusiasts, so I, I don't mean to insinuate you don't, but just in case, I want to give some background. And how many of you have not seen this? Everybody, oh, one, two, yeah, it, it's a great movie. And I know that some people have some issues with this battle scene or that, and that's all, you know, very legitimate. But I like it for how it shows the diversity of men fought in the United States Colored Troops. I, I, I like it doesn't caricature them, but instead each one of these different men represented here, right? That, that we get to learn about how maybe um, being a soldier was different for an enslaved man than it was for somebody who an educated uh, black man in, in the United States. And just to make a quick comment, um, Kevin Lehman is working on an auto, a, a biography, excuse me, of Robert Gould Shaw. Be watching for that because it is going to be really fabulous. But this is um, this movie is what really um, helped to reintroduce the topic of black men in the Civil War, um, and it continues uh, to be a good place to start if you're not familiar. But just some real, you know, kind of background uh, information for you here. And can I move this over and over? There we go. Is that good? So the Emancipation Proclamation was not when military service began for black men. There were several, um, uh, in Kansas, for example, uh, a regiment was formed um, in South Carolina, the Louisiana Native Guards. These are all men who are trying to offer their service to the US military uh, before the Emancipation Proclamation. But also black men had been uh, sailors uh, since we had a Navy. So there are black men serving in the US Navy um, as soon as the war breaks out and even before the Emancipation Proclamation. But of course, it is the proclamation that is going to drive the idea that black men can serve. And I have just this one section out of the final Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863. You can see here that Lincoln says, not only am I going to you know, abolish slavery in those states in rebellion, but I'm then going to allow those men to join my military. And Congress had already passed several laws along the way to get this started, but this is when the real push begins. The Bureau of Color Troops, created in May of 1863 as part of the War Department, was the main umbrella for organizing Black regiments. They oversaw how white officers would be appointed. They accepted regiments um, uh, created in the states that are turned over to the federal government. They oversaw recruiting, for example. And so, um, again, if you're not uh, familiar, um, in Pennsylvania, of course, you could have had the first Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, the fifth Pennsylvania Volunteer Cavalry. Um, black men didn't serve for their states, they served for the federal government. Um, this was one of the concessions that were made to try to appease white people loyal to, to the United States. And so even though they raised regiments in Pennsylvania and Ohio, once they collected those men into enough to turn over to the Bureau of Colored Troops, then they received a federal designation. So it was the first United States Colored Infantry the second United States Colored Cavalry, right? So they were designated as serving the federal government, not the states. About 180,000 men serve, and when you include those men in the Navy, this is 10% of all US forces. And I, I want you to think about that for a minute. That's, that's a significant number, especially when it was clear, even in Lincoln's own words, that this war was not about them when it began. 10% will end up being black men. 163 regiments 
Um, and there were some smaller units, so I included those in the other number. And they were all of the different infantry, um, cavalry, one light artillery, and then heavy artillery. They were in over 400 military engagements from very small, you know, just um, skirmishes all the way to major battles, like the Battle of the Crater, the fall of Fort Fisher. They were segregated. So these men that served in the United States colored troops served with all black um, privates and non -com, all the way to the non -com, um officers. And overall, only white men would receive commissions over these soldiers. There are a few exceptions, but no black men will lead others into battle. Not all African Americans believe that Black Americans should support this war, especially early in the war. And I'll make mention of that later. Um, once the Emancipation Proclamation is passed, that's going to shift. And you are going to get a much more united support for the war. When you look at the number of Black men who died from disease or were killed due to battle wounds, it is at a rate 35% higher than for white soldiers. And again, a number that's very telling. When Black men are first admitted in the United States color troops, Lincoln, the War Department, and their white officers do not believe they're going to be in very many battles at all. And so you would think that the death rate would be much lower. Where it comes in is the disease. Um, the unequal medical treatment, unequal access to, to medical treatment is one of the main reasons for that. Not the only reason. And overall, I want us just to just remember as we're talking uh, today that there was much discrimination and uh, racism in every aspect of these Black men's service. And this is not just by the enemy, but also by white soldiers in the United States. And I myself, and again, um, John Eric summarized some of what I have, have um, done before. I like to focus on the experiences of the men themselves. We have quite a few people that have told us uh, from the outside, uh, particularly you know, white officers or white soldiers. And what's missing is the voice of these black soldiers and their families. And I like to look into that. I, like, I want to make that available as other people start to write either stories and histories about some small event or even the Civil War in total. And so I think that getting out those voices is very important. And sometimes that might be one thing that I'm saying is all very positive. I want to be very clear. They, what they achieved, the actions they took were in spite of the racism and discrimination. It was ever present to an extent. So with that background, we can move in then to what's going on with recruiting, particularly Frederick Douglass. And my question is, how did the Anglo-African show us or provide at least the people at that time who are reading it during the war with information about his role? So the Anglo-African is an incredible source to learn about the topics that African Americans were concerned with during the war, um, actions they hoped to take. And this all started in 1859 with a publisher and activist by the name of Thomas Hamilton. And he established this newspaper to quote, afford a medium of communication whereby we, the people of color, might become better known to each other and to the community at large. Not only did they want to share their achievements, but he hoped this would be the vehicle to also recognize shortcomings and where they could learn and where they could improve. Over time, he is going to have some trouble financially. He will lose control of the paper uh, for just a little bit early in the war. Um, but eventually his brother, Thomas, or excuse me, he along with his brother um, and um, Robert and a man by the name of James McCune Smith. Has anybody heard of Smith, James McCune Smith? 
someone that should be a more common name. He was the first African American in the United States to have a medical degree. He went to Scotland to go to medical school, and he was an abolitionist, an activist, um, often behind the scenes. Probably why some of us are not familiar with him. But he's going to help, you know, get people to finance in this newspaper believing in, in its mission. And when um, Thomas Hamilton took the paper back over, he wrote, quote, we commence today the publication of a weekly journal, which shall be devoted specially to the best interests of the colored people in this and other countries. We alone are able to tell our story. Under the circumstances, it is not necessary for us to specify our objects but would only state that the free discussion of every subject of interest to our people will form one of the most prominent features of the paper. And so the first couple of years, um, when he starts it and when he reclaims it, the focus is almost, um, at least the larger focus of the uh, Anglo-African is about immigration. It's about this idea that African Americans, because they did not have equal rights here in the United States, should seek to go elsewhere, particularly Haiti or Liberia, which was the colony established by the United States uh, for Black people who lived in the United States to remove themselves back to Africa. And this is a hotly contested topic for African Americans living in the United States. Douglas himself is very much against immigration. And so uh, there can be some pretty uh, good sparring going on in, in, in this newspaper over this topic. But that wasn't all that the newspaper covered. The newspaper would have weekly reports from communities all around the Northeast, the Midwest, even as far as California, where Black correspondents would write and tell you what was happening in their churches, what was happening with fights for civil rights. Um, and again, uh, declaring uh, achievements that they were proud of, like starting a school or something like that. And so it was a wonderful communication vehicle to learn what was happening to others, right? Long before we could get on Facebook to look for something like this, you, you would get this weekly newspaper. So in addition to the uh, discussions over immigration, the local reports, you would have editorials by Hamilton and others that he brought in. When the war begins, you have conversations about should men fight, will contraband fight, recruitment, very proud uh, communities would send in words of, of what they were accomplishing, the abolition of slavery, particularly after the Emancipation Proclamation, and even uh, reports from the federal government and the US military updating families on what was happening. Because for the most part, uh, newspapers in the United States that were prominently white owned and read papers did not discuss most of the battles that black soldiers were in. So you could find this in the Anglo African. Now, this paper was sold to free black people that lived throughout the United States, but its reach went much, much farther because. Families would send copies to soldiers once they entered the, the military. Um, Hamilton himself uh, really got big in advertising that you should donate money so he could send 20 copies to this regiment or 100 copies to that regiment. And so by the end of the war, African Methodist Episcopal Minister, Minister James Lynch said that the African American, the Anglo African national reach Quote, we have felt its influence on the banks of the Mississippi during our ministry in Galena, Illinois, in Maryland, in the District of Columbia, and on the sea islands of South Carolina, in the cities of Charleston and Savannah, and even in the interior of Georgia. In other words, this paper is sharing these ideas, whether it's debates over recruitment or it is discussions about um, equal schooling and voting as we get closer to the end of the war. And it's not just going to prominent African Americans in New York City where it's published. It's going all over the United States. So where does Douglas fit in this? What, what does this newspaper reveal to us about his role with recruiting? Well, first of all, we want to recognize that Frederick Douglass published three different newspapers on his own. 
He had first the North Star and then Frederick Douglass's paper, um, which was a weekly, but it is going to suspend in 1860. And instead he, he spends more time with the Douglas Monthly. But look at that, it doesn't even take us um, to when Blacks are participating at their fullest, the end of 63 to 65. And in part that has to do with his belief that he will be recruited. So in part, it shouldn't be a surprise that we don't see Douglas's name mentioned in the first couple of years of the Anglo-African. He has his own newspaper. Uh, it's somewhat, you know, competition, right? The only real reference to Douglas that we can find before the war began is that Hamilton, who was also a bookseller, offered uh, Frederick Douglass's second uh, autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, for one dollar post paid. So he's right, he's sharing the story of this man's life, but you don't see any references to his newspaper, you don't see any references to, to what he's talking about. So he's generally missing. Um, there's one other newspaper at the time uh, that does continue, as a matter of fact, it's continuing today, called the Christian Reporter. And if you're not familiar with it, I suggest looking into it if you're interested in the topic of the United States color troops. Uh, the Christian Reporter was the newspaper for the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And so it also covers a lot of war news. Uh, the newspaper, the, the editors were against uh, participation early on in the war. But you also get a lot of war news. Um, the dominant feature, of course, is, is uh, the church, but you get a lot of war news. So between Douglas, who ends in 63, the Anglo-African and the Christian Recorder are the two ways that African-Americans can learn about what's happening in the war. So right from April 1861, we see this newspaper start to mention Black men trying to enlist and how in these various communities across the North and Midwest, they're told they're not wanted. We also see our first glimpse of rumors that the Confederacy might um, arm black men. Uh, of course, this never happens, but Frederick Douglass is really concerned about this. He's always, you know, he, he, one of the things he's mad at Lincoln about, is we gotta get a jump on that, because if they do this, Right, um, they don't. But still, these are these are being discussed in this newspaper right from April 1861. But it isn't until we see Douglas uh, mentioned in May, right after the war begins, and I can't get a clear uh, picture. I, I apologize. So I transcribed this for you, and you can see the first reference to Douglas Monthly here. And in this case, it's because, of course. Douglas is saying, hey, this war is our opportunity to end slavery. For Douglas, the war was about abolition, and even more so, it was about citizenship. Because for free Black people living in the United States who have been fighting for their equality, and if you did end slavery, you know, you have to have more than that. You had to, you had to be considered equal. And so the newspaper is recognizing that the Douglas is talking about potential uh, benefits or outcomes to this war effort. Now, his name continues to be absent from this newspaper. An, an example of a, a brief message of, of Douglas is from August of 1861, when one of those local correspondents wrote in, in this case, it was Springfield, Ohio. And they were having um, a celebration, as was very common during this era, for the um, West Indian Emancipation Day. So before US emancipation, um, African Americans in the United States celebrated when Great Britain ended uh, their involvement uh, with slavery. And so this newspaper article was talking about um, that a large crowd of um, African Americans had come to town. And one of the um, events was a, was a speech by Douglas, but there's no more uh, expansion on it. We don't know what he talked about or you know, what the people thought about it. So as we're seeing these, these discussions from 1861 to 1863 in the Anglo-African, and they're debating whether um, black men should support the war. Um, they're debating um, the um, 
Black men in the North and the Midwest start to create their own militia companies, and they try to turn over whole militia companies. Um, they're debating whether they should be doing this. Why would we fight for a country that doesn't honor our um, rights? Um, Douglas is relatively quiet, but again, remember, until 1863, he has his own newspaper that he can share his thoughts in. So there's really no need for him uh, to expand into these other areas of these other newspapers. By February of 62, we get our first real look at Frederick Douglass when the Anglo-African reprints an article from the Christian Re Reporter. Quote, Frederick Douglass gave a lecture in Philadelphia on the war. We saw almost at a glance that Frederick Douglass from before us was the Frederick Douglass of other days. And even more, his majestic bearing and dignity was not gone. The fire of his eye and the glow of his face were there. The power and influence of his voice, the cutting logic and lofty eloquence of other days were not diminished. So you see slowly the Christian recorders coming around to having more conversations about Black participation in the war. But in the same issue of the Anglo-African, a writer from St. Cloud, Minnesota, asked the question, quote, what ought our people in the North do for our brethren in the South? The writer feared for his forsaken and unlettered brethren who were unable to contend for their own rights. The same cloud man suggested that Northern Blacks organized and called on the leaders of the African-American community act to act, demanding, quote, where are Frederick Douglass, William Wells, Brown, William Wells Brown, and the host of other leading men? So in one day, we get two references to Douglas, one claiming he's this eloquent, wonderful speaker to speak for us, and the next questioning, why isn't he doing more? Well, after the Emancipation Proclamation, the final one is released in January of 63, we see Douglas much more frequently mentioned in the Anglo-African. And we know that he himself is reading the paper. Now, that is an unusual right? He's a newspaper editor. So these newspaper editors would get all the newspapers they could and they would reprint stories. So that in itself is not unusual, except that he stops publishing the monthly in 63. So he continues to purchase the a subscription to the newspaper. He becomes a donor. I think I have a copy of this. He becomes a donor because this Anglo-African is always uh, in financial uh, distress. And so uh, the brothers are frequently asking for donations and they recognize prominent people as well as some local people who would send in. So they're always recognizing who are supporting them. So we know that Douglas is supporting. Um, we know that Douglas um, actually suggested people read the Anglo-African um, in his paper, Frederick Douglass's paper. So it's not that he's against the Anglo-African before 1863, he just has his own newspaper. But it appears turning towards the Anglo-African as maybe his vehicle to get some of his words out. Because not only did he donate money to keep um, the, the paper going, a March 1863 article said that he was going to become a regular contributor to the Anglo-African. So it, it looks like this his closing his own newspaper opened the door for his voice to be more widely heard um, through this more far-reaching newspaper. And so from this point on, we start to see his speeches, sometimes references to speeches that have happened, sometimes reprinting whole speeches, sometimes announcing that one is coming in the future. So just a month after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, a Chicago writer shared that Fred Douglas, quote, who had defended humanity from the granite hills of New England to as far towards the Mississippi Valley as he dare go, had given a speech to an overflowing audience at Metropolitan Hall on the unnatural war now raging in this country, that truth and error are in deadly combat. Now, we can see here, again, sorry that it's not real clear, these are very old newspapers, and it's really hard to get copies of these newspapers. So um, what I have done is found the microfilm copies, and then I have to scan them. And so I don't know if you do what newspaper work, but this is as good as we can get. Um, here you can see a, a, an 
a short piece saying that he was going to be in Brooklyn, right? So this is even before he goes, but they would like people to attend. And he used these speeches as recruiting tools, absolutely. But they also were used to raise funds for different organizations, uh, particularly supporting the African-American community. Um, and sometimes um, he went to give a speech because he was paid to, he had to, you know, he had to work, right? And so if he was no longer publishing his newspaper, he had to have some kind of income. Just a few weeks before the Anglo-African posted news about the Boston talk, we can see a paid advertisement for the Cooper Union Institute. Um, this was uh, created or started in 1859 by one of the wealthiest Americans, uh, a man by the name of Peter Cooper. And he wanted this to be a school in New York City that included anybody and everybody. If you were a qualified student, no matter your race um, or whether you were a man or woman eventually, that you could attend this school. So they had organized classes for men. Um, several years later, they created some classes for women on a separate floor. But then he rented out the hall and any speakers that would talk about topics um, of interest to the entire uh, New York community uh, would attend. But the African-American community uh, really takes advantage of, of this building space and um, the support of Peter Cooper. And it was Peter Cooper that invited Douglas to come speak right after Lincoln released the final Emancipation Proclamation. Now, when the um, advertisement was placed in the Anglo-African, Hamilton then also had an editorial on that issue. And he proclaimed that the abolitionist turned recruiter would quote, give a good old war speech. And you can see the speech was the proclamation and the Negro army. And so through these speeches, through the reporting of the speeches, we can kind of understand that they're giving some attention to um, Douglas's recruiting efforts. Soon after, we're going to see the entire speech reprinted that Douglas gave that is quite well known because of the um, broadside here, all right? And what is fascinating, and here's a Gilder Lerman um, discussion about this here for you, is that Douglas gives this speech in Rochester, uh, New York, and it's not for about three weeks before this broadside is printed up and it becomes more well known uh, to the larger community. The Anglo-African is printing the speech word for word right after the speech. So if you were a reader of the Anglo-African, you, again, not to be silly, but right, you can't get on your phone and look this stuff up. It's not on the news on TV. You have to wait for the newspaper or somebody that might have attended the speech to hear what was in it. And if you were a reader of the Anglo-African, you're hearing it immediately. You're, you're reading it immediately, right? Just days after, before the rest uh, of the United States is really um, having access to it. And so this clearly marks this man as supporting recruitment and he's wanting to encourage and he's joining others uh, in the black community to full on start trying to get black men to join under the organization of the Bureau of Color Troops. So what does Frederick Douglass do for recruitment? Well, in February of 1863, he signed to be an agent to recruit black soldiers for the 54th Massachusetts and then the 55th Massachusetts. And he's asked to do this because of his prominence, that people knew him from the abolitionist uh, circuit. Some people read his newspaper. So they know who he is. They, he's an incredible orator. And so he goes out, he gives speeches, he writes letters um, sometimes, right? He's, 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 he's not traveling recruiting in the same way as some other recruiters, uh, but clearly um, using his rhetoric to convince Black men and the black, larger Black community that supporting the war effort is in their best interest. He had demanded from the beginning of the war that Black men help fight. And so this was his opportunity now to put his demands into action to help recruit 
Again, the Christian reporter, very slow to get on board. By the time uh, Frederick Douglass starts recruiting, they come around. And so you have the Anglo African supporting recruitment, you have the Christian reporter. And so when Douglas and other recruiters go out, there should be some at least uh, recognition of, of what they're trying to do. Now, recruitment initially um, wasn't too difficult. One, the larger desire by the Black community to support the war effort, leaving now what it had turned into a war for abolition after the Emancipation Proclamation. But it also coincided at a time when white enlistment was dropping very quickly, right? The excitement and the, you know, patriotism of initial April um, call from Lincoln, even the July 61 call from Lincoln, and the United States government has to resort to the draft. And this is going to be many white Americans who were not in favor of blacks helping to fight, now change their tune. They could keep their white son, father, husband out of the draft, and so be it, let these black men fight. So that shift allowed for this early recruitment to go fairly well. And of course, Massachusetts didn't have enough men uh, for three regiments, because they'll add the fifth uh, Massachusetts cavalry. And so these uh, recruiters had to go outside of Massachusetts. And so this worked well because of uh, this time Douglas is in New York. So he doesn't, again, have to travel as much as he didn't want to, some of the others. At the same time that Douglas is embracing this opportunity to help recruit men for something he thought should have started right at the beginning of the war, he is very loudly speaking out against the unequal treatment, unequal pay being at the center, right? Being really important for this. Also, though, angry that Black men could not get a commissioned officership. This is what he wants. Um, there were many men who were in, who would enlist as recruiters and get a commissioned post. Uh, and this is what he thinks is going to happen. Um, he faces it personally, but he sees it also happening with other men that are highly qualified, but no one will give them the opportunity. And again, the Bureau of Color Troops, it is their policy that only uh, selected white men will be in charge of these regiments. So he's calling out for this discrimination, particularly the pay issue. And he called on African Americans to participate in a, quote, double battle against slavery and racism. So the things that he's been working for his whole life are coming to a head here with this opportunity for him. But David Blight says that this constant fight against all of this inequality and the, the difficulties that start to arise when the first soldiers are getting unequal pay start to make it more challenging for recruitment. And this really becomes a problem with the issue of Black prisoners of war. And so briefly, um, the, the Confederacy never has a real solid policy. They, they have a very similar policy from their president, from their Congress, but basically, Black men in uniform would not be treated as prisoners of war. They would be considered slaves in rebellion, even if they were free men. And so that meant if captured, they would be sold back into slavery or executed. White officers of Black troops would face something similar. They would either be placed into hard confinement or put into some other kind of prison system. And Lincoln says, no. They, these soldiers are my soldiers and we will have an equal exchange. And so there's this tussle that's going back and forth, right? What are we gonna do? Because for the Confederates, acknowledging a black soldier as equal to one of their white soldiers was just beyond their belief or their purpose. Um, eventually there will be an agreement after Lincoln threatens to do the same to white Confederates that were captured. And that threat was enough for the Confederate government to back down. And I'm sure you've probably heard speakers talk about the prisoner of war system and how heinous it becomes after 1863. And this is when um, each side stops to exchange and when the large prison systems start to develop that led to men, um, high rate of disease and death. And these just horrible in both Confederate and US prison. 
And so while it seems settled for Douglas and others, they're still very frustrated because black soldiers who were captured were not only treated even worse than white prisoners of war, but they were treated poorly by white US soldiers because they were blamed for stopping the exchange. And so for Douglas, according to Blythe, it was just too much. And Douglas is gonna resign from recruiting in August of 1863. So we haven't even gotten into the major thrust of black soldiers' um, activities in the war before Frederick Douglass starts to pull away. Well, George Stearns was the man who had pr uh, promoted Douglas as one of the recruiters for the Massachusetts regiments, and he refused to accept Douglas's um, resignation and instead uh, organized a meeting between the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, Abraham Lincoln, and Frederick Douglass. Um, initially, Douglas is a little mad. He's being, you know, called out to the principal's office. He kind of resented this, uh, but he goes and he has what he thought was a really great conversation. And he left Washington, D.C., believing he was going to get commissioned officership. It never comes. And this is going to add on to his decision to stop working uh, for the recruitment. Now, I want to just share, um, the newspaper is always talking about recruitment and the Anglo-African, and they talked about um, individual communities, you know, reporting how many men left to join one of the regiments, uh, giving individual names. The, uh, Robert Hamilton sometimes pointed out prominent black leaders that one of their sons had joined. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that Frederick Douglass's sons are mentioned uh, Frederick Douglass's recruiting efforts are mentioned beyond his speeches, but his sons are mentioned. And I, I, I think it's important to point this out. Um, Douglass wrote to the paper in March of 1863 that two of his three sons planned to join the first colored regiment of Massachusetts, the 54th. In December that year, a short article appeared in the Anglo stating that his third son, Frederick Douglass Jr., enlisted in the 54th Massachusetts on recruiting duty. Already, his brothers, Lewis and Charles, were with the 54th station at Morris Island, uh, but Lewis was home. Lewis was not only injured at Fort Wagner, he had suffered from type fever. Uh, so I wanted to step back, and, and, and it's a great place to, to talk about the challenges of using newspapers for evidence. Um, this isn't quite what happened, right? We, we don't get any more information on these men, so if we only use the Anglo-African, we would be giving false, false information. Uh, Louis Douglas did, uh, he was a Sergeant Major in, in the 54th, but Frederick Doug, Douglas Jr. was assigned to the 25th. He was 25th United States Colored Infantry. He was never with the 54th. And Charles Douglas soon left the 54th to be in the newly organized 5th Massachusetts uh, Cavalry. So these, his sons are spread out doing different things. The newspaper itself, of course, doesn't pick up on this. So we always wanna be careful when we find great articles in a newspaper uh, to, to, to move out and look uh, at, at the larger story. So um, again, Douglas's own recruiting efforts uh, really are not um, being shown here. Now, in a July 6, 1863 speech at the Philadelphia National Hall, Douglas proclaimed, quote, once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters, U.S., let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket, and there's no power on the earth or under the earth that can deny that he has earned the right of citizenship in the United States. This is familiar to many people who study black soldiers or even some of the battles in the Civil War. This is repeated over and over. The, the, the term, uh, letting get an eagle on his button, for example. The speech is not covered in the Anglo-African. I mean, this is a recruiting speech, right? And it's not even covered. And in part, this has to do with the fact that the man who is sending a lot of the news from Philadelphia, a man by the name of Parker T. Smith here on the right, uh, he was an uh, intellectual and a, um, a black activist, one-time co-editor of the Anglo-African. 
He reports on a lot that happened that week in Philadelphia. He just doesn't mention Frederick Douglass at all and that he's trying to recruit there. And that's because these men are having quite the squabble and it's gonna spill over into the pages of the Anglo-African. And we can see this on the issue of equal pay for black soldiers, a really uh, often reported on, whether it be um, editorials by Hamilton, whether it be letters from black soldiers from the front writing home saying we're not getting equal pay, it's in every issue. In October of 1863, Douglas wrote to the Anglo-African angry that his views on the subject of unequal pay had been misrepresented. He wrote, quote, I hope no reader of yours will believe the statement in your paper of last week, purporting to have come from Colonel James Montgomery, to the effect that I advised members of the 54th Regiment Colored Volunteers to receive $7 a month. So if you've seen the movie Glory, you know that they, they say we're not taking that money. We were supposed to get full pay, so we, we're just not taking any pay. Um, and this is a serious act by these men. Um, we actually have a soldier in another regiment refused to take the pay, and he is executed for not following orders. So this is a very serious uh, risk that these soldiers take. And the article that he's referring to uh, claims that he had told these men that he had recruited, just take it anyway. You know, we'll get it settled, right? And it's being presented that he, Frederick Douglass, doesn't care they're getting paid less. Douglas went on to deny that any such correspondence had taken place and explained that in all of his recruiting letters, that his speeches, he made clear that if you enlist in the 54th or 55th Massachusetts, you are Massachusetts soldiers. So remember when I told you they had to take the designation United States Colored Infantry, Colored Cab? Massachusetts Governor uh, Andrew does not listen. He refuses to change their name. Um, only the 29th Connecticut continued throughout the whole war also without changing their name. They, they claimed they were state residents, not federal. And so Douglas is defending himself, saying, I've never lied, and even if pay isn't equal now, we're gonna get it there. He also took um, a shot at Montgomery, who, as you can see, um, he's also represented in the movie Glory, if you remember, when the 54th goes and um, destroys the one community, it's, it's Montgomery that has them do that controversial uh, leader of black troops. Um, Douglas takes a shot at Montgomery when he declared that, quote, our colored troops were promised gentlemen, not ruffians for commanders, and certainly none but a ruffian of the most despicable type would take advantage of his position to insult those of us in an insubordinate position. Now, Douglas had kept himself out of the debates over immigration that got him. He cannot keep himself out of this. Um, Parker is going to continuously jab at Douglas and his purported views. On November 2nd, Douglas wrote another letter to the Anglo African asking that, quote, your paper ceased to asperse me after Smith claimed that he had heard Colonel Montgomery had received a letter from Douglas that implied Douglas was not anxious for colored men to feel they are equal to white. I can only imagine what that was felt hearing that he's been accused of saying it's okay if they're treated unequal. It goes against everything that Douglas stood for. Douglas outright denied that he had ever corresponded with Montgomery or Montgomery's friends or anybody that knew Montgomery. Two weeks later, Smith declared that Douglas's letter asking for the uh, stopping of, of, of saying these things about him, um, quote, strange to say, it was a heterogeneous mass of nonsense. So, so you have even been sparring in this newspaper. And I think it's important for us to understand that even though the Black community after 1863 does come together largely to support Lincoln in the war, that internal debates are going to challenge some of that ability. Douglas had attempted to settle this outside of the public eye. Um, earlier, he'd sent a private letter to Robert Hamilton uh, talking about Smith, quote, who has in the last numbers of your paper made me the subject of sundry, squirrelous, and I fear malicious remarks, claiming that I wasn't enlisting enough men, that I didn't do a good enough job. Douglas retorted, well, whence came this general confidence in me as a warrior? When have I been heard of as a military man? 
He then, though, went on to complain that he still hadn't gotten any commission. <laughs> so, but his commission, of course, is a recruiter, right? What really, though, angered Douglas about Parker Smith's taking him out in public through the Anglo-African, quote, the fact that two of my sons are already in the military, Smith flippantly remarked that no man's son can work out his political salvation. Douglas said, I shall not stop here to combat this very profound remark. I depend on no man, father or son, to work out my political salvation. It didn't really matter about this debate at that moment because his recruiting career was over. He left, remember, in August of 63. It's unclear why Lincoln never approves a commission for Douglas. There were other Black men that got recruiting commissions. Uh, Mark Delaney, OSB Wall, uh, who recruited a lot in Ohio uh, before he became a captain. Um, probably the reason has to do first that Douglas was not a supporter of Lincoln. I mean, he comes out later saying that he liked Lincoln, but during the war, the evidence is pretty clear. He doesn't think Lincoln's doing enough, and he's very critical in his own newspapers and in some of his speeches. Also, it's because Douglas did not approve of the emigration of African Americans to Haiti or Liberia. He believed they were U.S. citizens and they had the right to live here. They shouldn't have to leave. And Lincoln, up until 1863, is trying to push immigration as colonization as a way to settle the problems uh, surrounding the Civil War. So it's not until later, um, after Lincoln is reelected in 64, Douglas does um, go and attend his inauguration. Um, they meet several times. And he's somewhat of a trusted advisor, although limited. But that's not the only reason that we see um, Douglas uh, kind of fall out of this recruiting and fall out of the um, Anglo-African, right? He's, he's, he's had it with Hamilton not protecting him, so he's not going to write anymore for them. He basically disappears from, from the newspaper. He's not recruiting anymore. Does this mean that the larger African-American community who depended on the Anglo-African for their news Think of him as somebody who's given up on them, or you know, if, if that's what they're getting, if that's the only information they're getting, and all of a sudden he just disappears after this public fight, would be easy for us to think that maybe he wasn't committed anymore. It's not the case. We see information about Douglas' continued support for the larger African American cause. It's just not through his own words. So here we can see. Um, his relationship with African-American women who organized to support the war effort. A letter to the editor in May of 1864 promoted the Grand Ladies Fair in New Orleans. They planned to use funds from this fair to give a grand reception for Douglas to speak in New Orleans. In January of 1865, the paper had a large advertisement for the Ladies Union Bazaar Association. And here is an earlier um, document of the organization. And you can see, um, maybe it's a little small for you, but you can see they're donating money for these wounded and injured ill soldiers. They're not getting equal treatment in the military, they argue, so they were gonna supply extra. Um, so the Ladies Union Bazaar Association planned to hold this, um, lecture and they were going to use the money to spend even more on these soldiers. In July of 1865, the treasurer's report for this organization was printed in the Anglo-African. The, proceed, the proceeds from Douglas's lecture alone raised $380. Now that's an 1865 money and I, is it still about 18 that we multiply 18 to 20? significant chunk of change. It's more than any of their other speakers that year. He drew that many people. It also, the treasurer included that Frederick Douglass made a personal donation of $25 to this organization. So he may not be actively recruiting anymore, but he's making sure, or at least trying to make sure that black soldiers are getting better medical care. Douglass's attention on recruitment and fair treatment of black soldiers um, morphed into the larger 
um, equal political and social rights. The Anglo-American reported that he visited the US Senate in April of 65 and sat in the gallery historically reserved for white citizens only. And in this case, um, a white man who did not think he should be sitting there amongst them uh, came up to him, uh, rudely affronted him, who are you? And people that watched and witnessed this said very calmly, but with pride, I'm Frederick Douglass, sir. And he says, uh, you're the real Frederick Douglass, sir? And Douglass just remained remain calm and says, I am Frederick Douglass. I, I have a right to be here. And we can see that kind of activity if you read about him after the war. So um, anyway, in May of uh, 1865, a letter from a Baltimore writer shared that they had decided on a name for a brand new building, a hall that was going to be used for public lectures and amusements of every kind to improve the colored po uh, population of the city. Um, and there was a group of people who created like a joint stock company. They raised $16,000, 1865 money to buy this building. And it was being used as a US hospital for soldiers. So as soon as the war was over, they would be able to take it. And they named this in honor of Frederick Douglass. And it was the Douglass Institute. Now, I just want to close with just a couple more things. And, and this is you know, the end of Douglas's name in the newspaper, a July 65 article uh, entitled The Fourth of July in Washington. It's this whole column talking about celebrating the Fourth of July. And this is, you know, right after the war has ended. A whole list of really impressive dignitaries are there. And um, this was put together by the Colored Lincoln Monument Society. And Lincoln, uh, Douglas is not on the list. Douglas sends his letter of regret. And this was read to the people in the audience. The one thought to be emphasized and deeply underscored on the occasion is the immediate and complete universal enfranchisement of the colored people of the whole country. I hope the able men who will speak on the occasion of your celebration will show the prophecy of 1776 will not be fulfilled until all men in America shall stand equal before the law. Douglas comes full circle. In 1852, he gave the first, for the first time, many, the speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. If you've not heard the speech, you can look it up. Uh, recently, his great, great, great grandchildren, they have them reading it. Incredible. But could he have imagined in 1865 speaking on the Fourth of July? Only 13 years earlier, he is talking about how to slaves that meant nothing. 13 years later, he's talking about suffrage rights for those same African Americans. This was the last time that Douglas's name is in the Anglo-African. The newspaper closed in December of 1865 after Thomas Hamilton died and his brother was too ill to take on the paper. The Anglo-African is recognized as probably the most important non-religious newspaper for African-Americans in the Civil War era. The lack of reference to Frederick Douglass's recruiting is, is not something that's facetious. Frederick Douglass doesn't really spend most of the war, or very little of the war, recruiting at all. But I think, I'll leave you with this, is that what's really important about trying to judge one little slice of Frederick Douglass's life, how did the Anglo-African report on his recruiting, or in this case, not report on his recruiting, is that it gives us a warning. We want to be careful not to cherry pick our evidence. If I were going to just research this, I could write about Douglas is not contributing hardly at all to recruiting, right? We need not only not to cherry pick a specific article or program uh, to give us our evidence, but we need corroborating evidence. And we could go out now and look at those autobiographies. We could look at the biographies and the hundreds and hundreds of pieces written on Douglas. And we could get a much fuller picture of what he believed about recruiting and how he went about it, even in a short period of time. But I think that this also gives us a point of view that might be left out. And I know it's left out of many, but that, that arguing that was going back and forth within the, with the community. Douglas, I will put on a pedestal, but he was human, right? And so even though the Anglo-African doesn't give us anything to uh, 
expand on Frederick Douglass as being a great recruiter, we know the totality of Frederick Douglass and his contributions um, to this war to preserve the Union that became much more for African Americans. Thank you. Um, any questions on how Douglas and Anglo African recruiting? Any questions? Yes, sir. I have a question about literature, literacy rates among Blacks at the North. I know the literacy was illegal in the South. Uh, any idea roughly how many, uh, what percentage of so we have a great question um, about literacy rates, particularly in the North, because um, Southern states, slaveholding states, made it illegal, and border states made it illegal for enslaved people to be taught to read and write. So no, we do not have rates. But what I can tell you is this, that more African Americans are engaged in reading and writing than anyone is giving credit to. And I want to qualify my statement. I am talking about the participation in reading and writing, even if you are not literate yourself. And so, for example, soldiers wrote letters for each other. They taught each other. White officers on spare time would teach. But this was going on in the antebellum United States. I mean, how Frederick Douglass himself becomes literate is he teaches himself, right? He, he, he watches what the white kids are doing. He, he copies it so he can get a, you know, a more formal um, instruction. And we also know that enslaved people, there were more that had access to at least one person that could read or write for them. So we're starting to finally see some of this being talked about. Now, when I say that, I mean in the modern sense. Um, when the first um, issues of the Negro uh, Journal, the Negro History Journal came out um, over 100 years ago, they're writing articles on all of this. And Fast forward a couple decades, you know, uh, the civil rights era, and historians just didn't seem to go back and look at what was being written, you know, 50 years before by black um, historians. Uh, I think of uh, Williams uh, wrote several books on black military service, for example. So it's higher than people are gonna have ever mentioned. Um, Education was difficult, obviously. Uh, not all states had public education like today. And I can just, I'm not sure how Pennsylvania did it, but in Ohio, um, they, they, it was locally determined whether it was segregated or integrated schools. So like Cleveland, uh, before the Civil War, they were always integrated schools, um, even after for a while. Um, and black residents of Ohio fought to get their own tax money that was going to schools that they were denied access to. And so they themselves created their own black schools. And so it's uneven, but there is more opportunity than we've recognized for education. So in a roundabout way, I, I can't give you numbers, but I can tell you if you really dig in and look, there are um, black men and women that are involved in reading and writing much more than we've ever given uh, recognition to. It's a great question. Yes, sir. With regard to the uh, trade issues, I understand that eventually they were paid the same as the white soldiers, and they were reimbursed back to the beginning of the resistance at the rate of the white soldiers. So they could get back paid for all that time. So yeah, the question is about pay and when it was equalized. So in the summer, um, July of 1864, Congress finally agrees to equal pay. And how the law was set up, if you were free before April something, first or 15th, sorry. Uh, but by April 61, if you were free, then your pay would be retroactive caught up to that equal to your position. So if you're a private, it would be a white private's pay. Non-commissioned, black non-commissioned officers, sergeant majors paid equal to white sergeant majors. And this was significant money. Um, so that meant for three fourths, because that was about the percentage uh, of soldiers who had been enslaved when the war broke out. That would mean most of them 
would not have access to that equal pay because the U.S. Army went by the Emancipation Proclamation. Having said that, I have seen so many records where because there's um, there's a place where officers had to fill out the information when they mustered in soldiers, their their height, the color of their and they had to put, and they would just put three paper for the one. They they all said the same thing, right? These men were not. So those were officers that wanted to see them get their retroactive pay. And then there were um, white officers who now this man's a slave, you know? And, and when the, just to add on to that, when the uh, pension uh, laws were changed during the Civil War to make pensions available to soldiers, then their families and their orphans, right from that moment, it said that it was for all soldiers. So on paper, Black men, women, and children had access to the same pension. It's not always out for doubt. Again, remember my comment right from the beginning, it's always discrimination and, and problems. But on paper, Congress didn't play a game with that. Yes. Uh, we have a question from Zoom. What evidence do we have of desertions and risk of directions, or how would they be? So that's, that's just a great topic. Um, I studied the 27th United States Color Group from Ohio as my entryway. Now I, I look at much broader. Um, but when I looked at just the 27th and I looked at their desertion rates, what I saw was equal to what white soldiers in Ohio, the best numbers that we could get. Not more, not less. The thing is, is that desertion, you know, you could be AWOL instead of charge with desertion. So depending again on the white officer, some were much kinder and, and, and willing to work with the men and explain what they had done because some of the men, you know, they don't know military rules, right? They're, they're learning this for the first time, which is a real problem. And I think Lori shows this really well, that enslaved men went from one master to a white officer who to them seemed like another one. And, and, and so learning military procedure some white officers accounted for that. So you can see it removed almost right away. What is I find disturbing is over and over I, again, I see men that were uh, charged or at least the officers wrote down they deserted. One actually, it was an Ohio black soldier and his officer said he deserted to the enemy. I mean, this is a free man, why did he do that, right? And then I find these men and they're prisoners of war. And so when they are in their older years trying to get pensions, you can't get a pension if you desert it and are, get a dishonorable discharge. You can't get a pension. So they're fighting to prove that they have not deserted. I don't study white troops closely enough to know if they had that same issue with AWOL desertion and all of that. But I can say that some of these white officers worked to help that not happen, um, or others just assumed, oh, they just ran away. And, they don't even look for them, so it's really well. If they move around a lot. I should, I should be fair. We need more on that, by the way. We need more on that. Yes, sir. Just curious, how are the white officers selected to lead the? So the question was, how were white officers selected? And so it was much harder to become a, an officer for the United States Color Troops than for any other regiment in the U.S. Army. So they had to take tests. And there were there were authorized testing stations. One was in Cincinnati, for example. And this was all arranged by the Bureau of Colored Troops. And so, of course, they were tested on military knowledge, but also um, history, for example. And they had to get a certain score. And then the there were there was a three-man body for each one of these um, testing procedures. And then they would forward the names of those men who passed on to the Bureau. And then governors could suggest somebody and if they were on the list and they all talked so they knew that's how you would become an officer. It didn't always happen that way though because there were men, again, I'll use the 27th because I have all their scores and there were men that were appointed who did not make the minimum score, uh, particularly in military uh, knowledge. And so what we know, it was difficult to get even men who could pass the test that were qualified or had maybe the, um, they really wanted people that were more um, empathetic uh, to, the, to the cause for African-Americans. 
Uh, for white men who could not get an officership because people didn't know them in their own regiment or didn't have a political friend, they saw this as a way to get beyond being in a non-comp position. And so that's why they're testing. They just, these men want the money for a commissioned officership, but they don't really. And they also, many of the white men that became officers, believed, as almost everybody in the Lincoln administration, that these black men weren't going to be on the battlefield. So wouldn't that be a great place to get, you know, that pay? So, um, you know, it's it's a mixed group that end up being officers, but they were supposed to take a test. They were supposed to have a minimum a score before that they could get it. And one in the very back, then we'll come here. What so um, I have uh, the literacy question is right up my alley. I'm trying to advocate the fact that we, we have to stop saying black soldiers didn't write letters. And there was a book published last year and they said black soldiers didn't write letters. And I've collected or found um, over 500 private letters, which to me means there's got to be many more out there. Um, you know, in the late 19th century, when we started to see our historical societies and museums professionalized, they looked for the great white men of the community, and that's how people wrote history back then, right? And so they didn't ask for them, or in a few cases, some black family wanted to donate, which by the way, right outside here, you have wonderful donation from one of the black uh, soldiers who were in the GR post. Um, so we're hoping that some of these are in families uh, being protected and, and, and respected and loved. Um, once in a while, they show up in auctions where I find most of them are in pension files because you had to prove certain things. And I'm trying to figure out how to share those letters. Um, overall, I would say this, when you pick up a book of edited uh, letters from the Civil War, they tend to choose them because they give great details about specific battles or political ideas or something like that. These are private letters. They're talking about this in their family. They're talking about supporting Lincoln. They're talking about um, they want to be home to hold their children. And I think we have to start including this in our discussion of the Civil War, that this isn't, you know, as much as I applaud the movie Glory, we, we got to get past that and go deeper and show the humanity of these people who gave up almost everything to defend a nation that wasn't respecting them. And I think we do that through their words. So really trying to figure out how to do that. I've been working on it for eight or nine years now. I have, they're transcribed. I'd like to do the annotation, you know, where you tell who people are in and where they were. I, I like to spend my time doing that. You're not supposed to do that too much. So that's my goal. I have to get that out there so people can use those letters and you can see this. Thank you for asking. I have a question about when the federal army demobilized after the same time. The new establishment then, I believe 24, 25 infantry regiments and cavalry, of which 9 10 cavalry were designated as black units. 24th and 25th were black. Was there an effort in Congress or in the establishment to kind of let's not have any black troops in the federal army? So we don't need them now, the war's over, and you know, any reconstruction is finished yet. But... So the question, sorry, the question is about after demobilization and the number of. Um, you know, over 160 regiments, what happens to those black troops. And you're correct, initially it was six. The U.S. Congress reduced it to six and then to four. The uh, 9th and 10th Cavalry, which was segregated black men, and the 24th and 25th Infantry also segregated. But something else is going on there because while not all troops went home in the summer of 65, you did uh, want to keep, uh, you know, an army presence in, in occupied the South or the Southern states. And most of them, not most of them, but most of the black troops are gonna remain in because they joined later. So they're three-year terms, right? If you enlist in 64, your three-year term is not. So it made sense white troops that had enlisted in 61, you're gonna send them home first. That, that was kind of the, the thought. 
There's also a little retribution in there. They understood leaving black soldiers in uniform with guns when returning men who fought in the Confederacy came home and going to be in your face. They, they, they understood that was the reason. But also there's a significant number of black troops sent to the Texas border. Uh, France is trying to put a pop-up government in Mexico. And so the United States is trying to you know, prepare in case something happened. So there were black troops in the United States, colored troops who served until 1867, maybe even as early, early 68, some Kentucky regiments that are there, you know, after the reduction, right? So it gets a little murky in there. Um, Congress doesn't try to get rid of the segregated black troops, but they do move them out west. And so they become one of the prime groups used to fight in the Indian Wars after the Civil War. Um, they, they, they know they cannot keep that tension in the South. Southerners do not want them there. The Axis do not want them there. So they're sent there. Um, and then they continue to have those war regiments uh, until after the Spanish American War. Yeah. Your comment about the mission reminded me of a term I was just recently learned about that racism is just another form of classism. And I haven't thought of that. So this kind of presence is, is going to be with us a while longer. You know, it's continuing to talk. And so the comment was about how racism is a form of classism, and that's one of the challenging and sometimes frustrating issues when you study African American history. My focus is civil war and after uh, in the late 19th century, but certainly this argument has been played out um, with colonial America becoming in the United States, and as you say today, um, it's a chicken and an egg thing. And so you can find historians who come down and know it's all racism. You can find historians who know it's all class. Um, most, though, see that it's an entanglement. Um, when you really study the big picture, the ways that keeping African Americans and sometimes other groups in, in a supportive position is so built in to everything that is the United States. And it started because of racism. And then it gets entwined with, with us. And so that, that's for a theorist way beyond my uh, ability to read Civil War letters. But I'm glad that you're thinking about it, right? Because if we can get people to think about it, not take a side, think about it, that's a great thing for us just to start thinking, opening up the conversation. I was just thinking about no matter how much money an African American or one time it was the other other people from the Mediterranean, you know, the Irish, you know, the for the um Erie Canal, they hired all of them because when they got it, they didn't know them. But then it was a slave and it was worth So yeah. Yes, it's a complicated and but it's our story. It's our story. If you're a US citizen, it's your history. Right, and it, it, you don't have to be of any class or race. It's it's so entangled with our history. And the more we try to get to understand it, I think is better for all of us. And again, I'm not asking anybody to take that. I'm saying let's have the conversation. It's very complicated, absolutely. So if anybody else has questions, you can contact me this way. And um, if you're interested in the 27th, I do have a couple copies of my book. And I just want to say thank you all very much. The questions, the um, everybody on Zoom, I meant to say hello, I'm sorry. So thank you for having me. Thank you. 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 Thank you.